Hey everyone, and welcome to Wildlife Inspired. I'm your host, Scott Keys, and today I've got a special guest. He's been on the show before, Josh Galicki. I consider him to be one of the best wildlife photographers out there. We're gonna talk about approach, getting close to subjects, and how to do it the right way right after this. When I took this, I just wanted the head, the eye, the bill to be all sharp, and then the rest just to like melt away. The thing I have to say with ducks is it's hard to get creative with ducks or waterfowl in general. All right, well, I'm back. Uh, wait, Josh was here a minute ago. Um, damn it, I don't see him. He Can was. You see me? He was there. Let me see. Oh, wait, wait. <laughs> There he is. He's moving. <laughs> All right. And, and there's our, our kitschy little intro. Uh, Josh, welcome back to the show. How are you? Good, good, Scott. Thanks for having me. And uh, look forward to the discussion. I think it's a pretty cool topic. And uh, yeah, can't wait to get into it. Yeah. So um, for those of you that don't know Josh, uh, we've been friends for a while. Actually, we don't shoot. We Josh lives in two states, so he spends a little bit of time in Pennsylvania, a little bit down in Maryland. Um, when he's in Pennsylvania, he's close enough. We actually shot uh, about a month ago. I wish I, I wish I could shoot with him more. Um, I, I always I told him before the show, it's a little intimidating having Josh on because he's such a good photographer that when you put your images up next to his, you kind of feel like crap sometimes. But um, he's he's really wonderful. Uh, before we get into the show, though, I do want to do um, just a couple things. So I, I had a couple announcements. What's coming up on the show? It's the end of August now, and in September. I'm going to do a couple themes. Well, I'm going to do one theme on two avenues. So it's going to be social media September. I'm doing a whole blitz on really Instagram for me, since that's the, the venue I use the most. I've got videos about who to watch on Instagram for wildlife photography, who to watch for bird photography. Uh, a spoiler alert, Josh is in one of those episodes already as, as part of a countdown. The other part is um, just Instagram in general or social media in general. What are the good things about it for wildlife? What are the bad things? What are the negatives? So I have a couple videos already shot and made and ready to go. So if you go over to the channel, you'll actually see those videos queued up, ready to go. I'm doing another video about how Instagram raises and lowers the bar. And then I'm also exploring this concept this month about social media and social anxiety or just pressure. I've gotten a lot of great feedback when I've talked about this in the past. So over the next couple of weeks on Instagram, you'll see a lot of polls out there about just anxiety and what, you know, how does Instagram make you feel? Forget the images. How does it make you feel? And uh, I'll talk about that as well. So that's what's coming up on the channel. Um, to jump into today's topic, we wanted to talk, Josh and I were talking about, you know, getting close. And, and I get asked a lot, like, how do you get so close to these subjects? And I thought Josh and I were shooting uh, last month. We were in a situation where we were shooting subjects at, you know, probably what, Josh, eight, 10 feet, 12 feet sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really that close, definitely, yeah. yeah, definitely walking up there. So uh, we're going to go through some images. So before we, we jump in, I do want to um, kind of explain why does it matter. So I'm going to let Josh go first on this one, but what are the benefits of being close to your subjects for you? So in other words, you, you, you are in situations where sometimes, not everything, you'll see the gallery here is, is wonderful. Sometimes you do like to get close to your subjects. And what's the advantage of that? Yeah, um, one thing I'll say that, you know, at the beginning of the discussion, getting close is important. And we're going to talk about concealment and other things. But I think the most important thing that I can relate to anyone in wildlife photography is you have to know your subject. You have to study your subject. There's no substitution for hours in the field, days in the field, knowing the behavior of the animal. Once you know that and you know your subject well, it's going to help you because you can study the behavior, watch their movements. And that's going to help you when it comes to approach and just getting close in the first place. Uh, concealment is a part of that. So one thing I would say is you want to do your homework. You want to know your subject. And I think when it comes to uh, most wildlife, it, wildlife in general, uh, while they're skittish of, of humans for due to persecution, hunting and so forth. So they won't let you get close. So <laughs> we have to take it upon ourselves to be as creative as we can to get close, but also not to disturb. Because once we get close and we get set up, really two things can happen. We either try to force the moment, which I would argue is a bad thing because you're creating an artificial scenario, or you be patient and you sit there and wait, and then you can actually get natural behavior. 
And that's really what you want. And anybody with a trained eye, I think, can make that, that differential. When you right. I, I think, Josh, you're, you're, you're dropping a little bit. Look at it. I go, you know. Oh, sorry about that. Um, but all that said, getting close is important. But the most important thing I would say is know your subject, understand the behavior. And when you get there, you need to be patient. You need to wait for the moment and not try to force the moment. Yeah, and I, I would agree 100%. I think the biggest mistake that I made when I first started and what 90% of beginning photographers, the biggest mistake they make is in an effort to get close. First of all, I think there's a perception that close is always better. So people are constantly forcing close and that is not always the case we're going to show you in our galleries a lot of close images but i can assure you if you look through mine and josh's plenty of our images are very loose compositions with smaller and frame subjects so you don't have to be close but since it's that's the topic you're going to see a lot of that so don't think that that's the only way to do it um the second thing is people attempt to get close by pushing forward or even chasing and that is never a good look as soon as as soon as the subject's on alert the image loses all of its authenticity so when you're capturing behavior preening and eating and you know doing all those natural things that's what that's what always makes the best images when your subjects look natural not aggressive not on alert you know you'll see and, and as a as a somebody gets more and more into wildlife photography they will notice those little signs of aggression and alertness and to me it is a little bit of a detractor so i wanted to get into this topic the other thing i, I wanted to talk about with proximity is there's two things um that i wanted to, to explore and that's depth of field so I'm gonna real quickly pull up a, um, let me get over here, there we go. I'm gonna real quickly pull up a few images. And these are images that were shot very, very, very close. The interesting thing, I'm gonna show you a bunch of songbirds. These are all captured during fall migration um, and all captured because I just find spots and wait. The, none of these birds are chased. Every single one of these birds landed on a perch somewhere near me. I was not moving, I was not chasing them, I was just staying in one spot. And I've got a couple of nice spots during fall migration where I get some good activity. So um, you'll see the dip in the depth of field. The reason I wanted to show this as a depth of field, one of the effects you have is you get the in focus head and the out of focus tail. Now, some people don't like that effect, but I love it. You look at this prairie warbler, you can barely see the tail. And so it's just an effect that I like, but that's one of the things that'll happen with depth of field. And here you can see this American red start again, like the tails are just almost completely out, but the eyes are real sharp. So I really like this look. It's something I do. The second thing I wanted to talk about with, with approach and getting close and why it matters, I did a blog a long time ago and I actually stumbled across it while I was on here. I'm not sure how well these images are gonna show, but uh, let me click this, this first set. What you're gonna see here is these subjects are all shot with the same lens. The background is the same distance away. So in every one of these shots, the background, I think I put it at like 10 feet, if you want to read this blog, it's about 100 years old, but you could read it. Um, but all I did was start at minimum focus. So the first shot on the left is shot at six feet away. Then I move back six feet. The next one is 12 feet away, which for most songbirds is about good, good range. Most people would love to be 12 feet away from a songbird. The third one's about 18 feet away, which is probably much more realistic for most songbird photography. Now, look at the difference in the background. There's a set of rails back there. At 18 feet away, those rails are very obviously and very, uh, to me, very distracting. I, I would not post this image personally. The second one, it's kind of borderline. Imagine those posts being sticks. So they're still there. They're kind of obvious. They're not quite as bad. But look at what happens when you get six feet away. When you get that close, and I'm shooting this with a 300 millimeter 2.8, by the way, just so if people are wondering, how do you shoot at 300, at six feet away? It's a 300 millimeter lens. Look at how that background just goes away. It just completely disappears. So that's what I wanted to, to just kind of show and illustrate. One of the advantages is when you are trying to isolate a subject, when you can get close, so at minimum focus, so for a 500 millimeter lens, most lenses, that's around 10 to 12 feet. 600 millimeter lenses, most lenses, that's between 10 and 14 feet. They're all different, but you know that's the range you're looking at. But when you're at minimum focus, it does create a difference in the separation that you get from your subject to the background. So one of the benefits for me of getting close is that fact that you can then blur out the backgrounds and really make the subject stand out. All right. So that was my, uh, that was my kind of introduction. One of the things that I wanted to point out, because a lot of people ask me as a photographer, they'll see me, you know, close to subjects and they'll say, well, you got a big lens. Why do you have to be so close? You know, back away or, or you don't have to, 
uh, always be so close. Well, there is an advantage to it, and this is this is one of those advantages. All right. You know, Scott, I've been shooting a lot of macro recently, and you know what you just explained really comes into play. I mean, you know, most folks who are shooting birds, you know, me for the most part, I'm wide open. You try to get as close as you can, or however you want to frame it. But when you're shooting macro and you're super, super close to your subjects, you know, those exercises mean a lot because you know it ultimately comes down to what you want to have in focus versus the background. So yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's a, it's a whole different way of thinking. Yeah. And focus is so important when you're doing either the really close work um, at, again, minimum focus, or for those of you who that are playing around with macro, or if I've got some macro photographers listening, um, you know, the slivers of depth of field. I mean, it is, it is so frustrating. Sometimes I'll shoot a bug, I'll take 30 frames, I'll look at the back of the camera, and maybe I get one where the eyes are in focus. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge. I have got uh, your gallery up now, Josh, can you see that on your screen? Yeah, I can see. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up. So you'll see Josh here. Um, this is t this is pretty typical Galicky right here. Knee deep, <laughs> knee deep in the mud. Uh, let me close yeah. this out. There we go. Yeah, and this is like a, a bit of an awkward situation, not a normal situation, I should say. But one thing I think that's important too for everyone who's listening when it comes to getting close and concealment, if you're in situations where you're in a remote situation where the animals don't really come across humans that often. This this actually was taken in the Falklands a couple of years ago. You could see the uh, rock copper penguin just to the right of me staring at me. They were more curious than afraid. You can walk right up to these birds. Um, when I was in Alaska, actually not that long ago, uh, the, the salmon run, the bears could care less. They were feeding on salmon. They're, these were coastal brown bears. We got very close to them. They just didn't mind that. They didn't mind our presence. They were used to people. And even you know locally, uh, shorebirds. When you have juvenile shorebirds, these are birds that are born up in the Arctic and they're migrate, migrating down. Actually, right around now, I shoot them along riverways, beaches, and stuff. They've never seen they've never seen humans before. So in some cases, they're curious. So they they will allow for a, a fairly easy approach. So if you're in public places or places where people are used to people, or where animals are used to people, or you're in situations where the animals don't come across humans or they're preoccupied with other things, you can get very close. Actually, that's got the shot that you have up, Scott, the two albatross. That was with a 16 millimeter, and I actually took that handheld. I crawled right up to these two albatross. That was a mating display in the Falklands. They just couldn't care less. So when it comes to camouflage, blinds, throw blinds, all that stuff, and we'll get into it, it matters, but it doesn't always matter. Yep. So again, you need to know your subjects. If you're in particular places, you don't even need, you could just walk right up. I, I was just sitting on the beach and these three Gen 2 penguins walked right past me. Um, this was in the Falklands. Again, wildlife that's just more curious and just you know not afraid of humans. They just, but again, these are remote situations. More often than not, this is the exception. Yeah, it, Josh is a pretty humble guy, so I will tell you this. Um, Josh, Josh puts images into contests sometimes. He gets like like 200 finalist images in every contest he puts it in. There'll be like, you know, there'll be like a top 100 list and Josh will have 20 of them. I, I, I'm not even making this stuff up. This, this I know for a fact, this, this did something. This won some kind of stuff, right? Like, or was very published. Yeah, this was in uh, Bird Photographer of the Year a yeah. couple of years ago, actually. Yeah, yeah, which was really great. I was happy to see it, and it's it's one of the best contests, and you know it was really cool to see that. Uh, th again, this happened right in front of me, no blind, nothing, just you know laying in the water. Right when the sun came up, this bear was fishing. These bears were playing around, fighting, uh, scrapping a little bit. You know, again, nothing on moose rut. They're preoccupied, didn't care. So. Um, Again, in many instances, this was actually in Wyoming. It was a huge elk herd, actually. They, you, you could see the uh, the bull in the back, um, you know, pushing the harem across. It was amazing. Just sat along the river, quiet, no blind, was able to get those shots. So, um, again, it ultimately comes down to knowing, being situationally aware, knowing your environment, and knowing when you need to conceal and, and, and to use certain tools. Macro, for instance, here, again, you can, in, in many cases, you can walk right up. This is a young snapping turtle. Um, didn't care, didn't really mind my presence. So I got a headshot here. Um, spring peeper, took this at night, uh, walking around a local park of mine. Um, again, no need for concealment, you can walk right up. So there, there are gonna be these situations, you just need to know uh, when to do it. 
public parks, for instance, uh, you know, parks and cities where these birds see humans all the time. There's people walking around. I've taken shots. As a matter of fact, that that previous shot of that cormorant, I took that in a suit after work. <laughs> I walked, <laughs> I walked down and. I have a little yoga mat I just throw down and yeah, I had a tie on and suit. So again, um, it just depends on the situation. So you don't always have to camel yourself up or be in a blind. It just depends. Here's an awkward situation right here. This is a saw what you're showing. Uh, this has happened to me with this species before, but this spring that bird was calling and I just followed the call. It was early one morning and I was able to basically walk right up to it. Uh, it was amazing, and you could see that the sun was just coming out, and the light couldn't have been better. It was just hitting this bird. Uh, the owl was perched, uh, and I think it was a dead hemlock. It was a it was a thick thick grove of hemlocks, and uh, he was perched in there. It was something. So again, uh, you can get this, but in some cases, this is more the exception. Yeah. Um, and then you could use a vehicle as a blind too. We can talk about that, but go ahead. Yeah, in, in one of the things you had mentioned, I'm just gonna show you a couple images here. Um, this, I'll scroll through mine pretty quick and it, the, you'll see this, this pattern. So this, here's a spotted sandpiper pretty close to me. Now, how does he do this? I mean, this is minimum focus, right? He's close here. This is, I don't know, 13, 15 feet away, close for a, a decent sized shorebird. This is, you know, eight feet away. And the key for me, and I'm going to show you a bunch of these images and notice every subject is going to be looking at the camera, facing the camera, or in this case, you know, sideways to the camera, but here's another clapper rail, pretty secretive bird, you know, walking right up to the camera. Here's a, a hawk, which you don't get often moving right at me. And here he is taking off at me. These, by the way, wild birds. Um, if I saw this, if I saw this red shouldered hawk on somebody's feed right here, I would tell you that was a baited hawk. So I'm always very careful with my captions <laughs> to tell people when I when I get an image like this, this is this is a wild animal. Um, harriers knowing flight paths and the pattern on these. The, the, th the point I wanted to make about all of these is no camouflage on any of these. No camouflage on any of these. Every one of these was done by predicting the movement of a subject or anticipating where they would go. And I'll use this this coyote as an example. The other ones all have the same theme, but this coyote was walking kind of in the back. And uh, I was in a car, I saw him, I got out of the car, he saw me, and I didn't have a really great shot. So I just stayed there, I didn't push, I didn't go forward, I just sat, stayed there and watched him. And he sat there for a minute, and then he started to walk over a hill. And as soon as he did, I scooted around to the other side of the hill, I beat him to the spot where I thought he was gonna to come across. And then I got out of the car, and I just waited and waited and waited. And about two minutes later, he came right up over that hill. And this was, for me, I don't shoot coyote. This was the best shot I've ever had of a coyote. So I've, I've photographed maybe three in my life. We just don't have a whole lot of them out here um, where I live. But um, that's how I got that. And the same thing applied to basically all of these images. It was just kind of seeing maybe a pattern or, or thinking, hey, they're probably going to come across this way and waiting. And then a couple of them were just being in an area. I was, this was a couple of weeks ago. I'm just, or a couple of months ago. I'm in a marsh, I'm shooting these other birds, I'm kind of just behind a rock, I'm not really super hidden, and this snowy egret just lands next to me. Like, this is not really cropped that much. But because I was there so long, he just got comfortable. He said, I guess this guy's part of the landscape. And then again, just waiting and waiting and anticipating. Uh, Josh and I spoke real, real quickly uh, before the show about diving ducks and somehow you can anticipate, you know, when they're underwater and when they're coming up, and this is a Pacific loon that, that's one of those diving ducks. Um, yeah, when, and, when they when they dive, I, I run like hell. If you yeah. to reposition yourself, wait for them to dive, and, yes. <laughs> and then quickly yep. move. Yep, and same thing. This is a for for me. This is a, a rare bird around here. Red neck grebe is is not a common bird. Um, this was about you know fifteen feet away, and it was all about waiting. I'm sitting in my car. I see him. He's close to the shore. If I open the door and run up on him, he's gone. So you wait for the dive. You time it. You count, and you're just patient and patient and patient. And then you get down there and then you just don't move. And I will tell you, if you're ever in a situation where you're photographing something and you've changed position, I didn't even move the lens. So it's so tempting to want to take that picture and, and, you know, spin around when he pops up. That'll put him on alert. So let him come up, let him feed, let him do their thing a little bit and then make slow movements. Now you could see he's starting to give me side eye here because I did have to move my lens a little. And that's when he noticed 
hey, there's something here. And then a couple minutes later, he didn't, he wasn't spooked or anything, but he, as ducks will do or waterfowl will do, he just kind of slowly turned his back and just slowly pushed away from the shoreline. Very casual, but I was able to get this one shot. So um, I'm going to switch back to your album now. And you had mentioned, you know, when, using, go ahead. Yeah, you know, one thing I was going to say, Scott, and um, I'm not a hunter. I, I was never a hunter, but I grew up in a hunting culture. And I was told by a number of hunters growing up, if you're going to approach wildlife and you're not doing it concealed, you're not already set up, don't look the animal in the eye. And I've always tried to do that. I always try to avoid direct eye contact, um, not come in a direct path. I'll wander around, come in at different angles. And it actually works. It really does. So it's something to think about. Um, yep. Sometimes, you know, if an animal is fairly skittish and it knows you're approaching or it looks like you're approaching at them directly, especially if you're walking. Uh, and you make eye contact, boom. Yeah, with with waterfowl, one of the, the tricks I use if I don't have concealment, so there's sometimes spontaneously where I'm in the car and I'm not necessarily planning on shooting that thing, but I see it. So I see a duck and I'm, I don't really have the setup for it, but I'm, I'm gonna try, so I go down to the shoreline and I'll take a hood. I almost always keep a hoodie, like a waterproof type hoodie. And if I can get set up, I'll just take the hood and throw it over my head so that it's draped over and that will cover my entire face. And then you really rely on the viewfinder to kind of like look through there. Um, sometimes the lens itself, I think, intimidates them when you, you see this big piece of glass. But I think you're right about the eyes. I, I have the same belief that that when they see your eyes, you're, you're probably, it's probably too late. Mm -hmm. What What is this? <laughs> Don't try this, by the way. This is just, it was kind of funny. Uh, we were in the Maasai Mar a couple of years ago and I picked up, that's a wildebeest skull. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, yeah, you can try to intimidate or uh, uh, imitate wildlife at times. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. That was one of the smelliest things ever, too, by the way. I made a big mistake on that. Oh. But uh, uh, and it, the purpose of some of these photos, just to show is, you know, and this was in Africa, you're in a vehicle, not that you have a choice, but uh, using a vehicle as a blind is huge. Whether you're driving in Africa and you're seeing a lot of this, these behaviors, animals, for whatever reason, when it comes to vehicles, for the most part, they don't seem to mind as much. Step out of the vehicle, it's a whole nother story. Um, this is a uh, Impala here, uh, rounding the herd up. Uh, this was uh, just that sunset, actually, when we were driving back from the Mara. There's a mother leopard and her young cub hopping over a river, or just a little bank near the river. This was, um, this was in Kenya. Uh, but again, you get these uh, natural behaviors. The animals just kind of go about their daily life. And being in a vehicle, it disguises the human form. And it helps. Um, it's certainly a lot better than being out and being on foot. Uh, that was a weaver. This was in, uh, that was Kilimanjaro, actually, some zebra uh, oh, yeah. foraging right in front of Kilimanjaro. It was incredible. And again, all these are out of the vehicle. You're just driving around uh, and you just wait to see things. And again, it doesn't have to be Africa. Like I said, this was in Maryland. Uh, driving around, short-eared owls are very skittish. Um, you really can't walk up to them. It would be very abnormal for them to just let you slowly walk up to them and approach if you're not concealed. This was taken out of the car of a really cool tree, like one of the coolest trees. And, and you, know, you can see the scenario here. I put this in. Things really changed. Uh, a bald eagle came in. Uh, the shorty uh, obviously left and gave way to the bald eagle. And then some fish crows came in and some other things. And the shorty, of course, was upset and kept dive bombing the, the bald <laughs> eagle. But again, just out of your car, be impatient, pull on the side and just wait and see what happens. This was the same short-eared owl. After that, um, I spent a few hours there that afternoon. And again, just drove up really close and it was just perched on a muskrat mound there. It's pretty cool. Very cool. And I'll scroll this through. Was, Are these yeah, all from the car? Angle. Okay. All from the car. Uh, the, the previous two, uh, that was a bison, uh, white angle, American bison, Yellowstone, where Lamar Valley just shot right out of the car. If I got out, it probably would have been a different story. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> it, it's not a good story. Yeah, it's it's true. I, I actually have a couple here. Um, you know, I was sitting waiting in the car uh, and did not expect I, I was kind of looking up into the branches. And here's an oven bird that literally just walked up to the car. So mm -hmm. it, it those things do happen. If I was on foot, I don't think the same thing would have happened. And it actually stayed there. I photographed it for a while. It just kind of hung around the area. It never flushed. It never got scared. It never got intimidated. I use the car a lot. Uh, this is a Dick Sissel that's local, uh, shot him right out of the car window. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit, Josh, and I'll, I'll kind of jump in here. One of the things, if you don't have, um, you know, the, the concept of using the car as a blind 
is to give yourself some concealment. And when you don't have, let's say, a blind to set up, it is helpful to find other types of concealment. So I'm gonna run through a series of images and then I'll jump back to Josh um, and I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna show some of his, but these are situations where I was using something to block or get in between. So here's a snowy egret, it's feeding. I see it in the distance and I'm in the water. So it's kind of like I'm trudging through the water. And honestly, there's no way I wouldn't have flushed them. I mean, I'm, I literally am like trudging through waist deep water, but I saw this patch of reeds. So instead of going beeline at them, I cut off to the side, then went up behind these reeds. Now, two things happened. One, he didn't he didn't see my shape, so he he didn't flush. Second thing is it actually offered this really nice foreground framing. So I, I actually got the benefit of, of getting some of that. And here you see it again. Now I'm in position and look, he's coming at me because I'm concealed, I'm there, I'm good. And I'm just using my lens in between those. And the, the next series of images that I wanted to show, a lot of these are waterfowl, but these were all taken without any camouflage. I'm not in the water. All of these are taken from the shoreline. But in every case, I have something in front of me. So maybe a log or some grasses. In this case, I don't think you can see it, but there's, there's actually reeds right there. And I kind of worked my way through the reeds to the edge of the water. And it was firm enough that I could actually lay down in it with a yoga mat. And, and that's what I did. I just sat right on the edge of the water. I got this shot where he flushed. And uh, same thing here. You know, this is, I have a, a whole series of wood ducks that I shot. And all of these were just literally on the edge of the water. I was shooting some other ducks one time and I was again using these reeds along the edge of the water and I'm parked in between the reeds and because this I, I don't see many ruddy ducks there are not a lot of ruddy ducks in Pennsylvania this guy literally I'm shooting ring neck ducks that are 20 feet away he literally swam I bet you three to four feet in front of me he just came right around the corner and I couldn't even shoot him he was so close I, I just had to wait for him this is almost uncropped. So he was probably, I don't know, eight feet away, 10 feet away when I shot that one. And here's that same series of that ruddy duck just right in front of me. Really, really neat. And then I'll, I think this is the last series, but same, same concept here. Using these tall reeds, I see the bird out there. I know if I make a beeline to the shore, he's done. So I, I, I start way back. I get behind the reeds and I just walk into the reeds so that he can't see me or she can't see me. Well, this is a he. And then I just find a spot along that shoreline. And normally I try to wait on the other side so that they'll eventually hopefully swim around. And again, you, Josh talked about these natural behaviors. That's what we want. We don't want that bird on alert. So if I have to take a chance, a 50-50 chance that I pick the wrong side, but I'm gonna be there first and get set up and not move, then I got a chance he's gonna come around the corner. Now, if I pick the wrong side, he goes the other way, I get nothing. But I know what if he comes the right way, I'm gonna get the good shot. And if I push at him, for the 100% chance that I'm gonna shoot him, it's probably gonna be a 0% chance that I get anything that looks natural. Um, so that's that's kind of what I wanted to show in this series. These are all again, gosh, this bird is a, this is a stitched image because it was too close. Um, so I stitched three frames together to get this one. Again, I was shooting this bird, not moving. This guy came over my shoulder the other way. So I'll, I'll go back, I'm gonna show a couple more um, series of things that I shot very similar, but but with camouflage netting on top. And I'll jump back to Josh's slides. You have a series you here know, that's a little different because you shot these from kayak, right? Yeah, yeah. And one thing I'll say, you know, just kind of a, I, I guess I'll call it a pro tip, whatever you want to call it. But when it comes to shooting waterfowl, I'll always try to maximize my chances in terms of what I can get by finding um, ducks or whether it's greaves, loons or whatever on smaller bodies of water. So if you're able to locate things around smaller ponds, that increases your chances that they're gonna one flow by you or get close to you or there's gonna be any type of interaction. If you're shooting or you try to set up on a huge lake, then obviously your chances go down because they could be on the other side and in a way out of sight, it would just be a uh, a pepper flake, if you will. So yep. I, I like that term. But again, um, positioning yourself and choosing where you shoot matters a lot. And I try, again, when it comes to this stuff, I try to get to small bodies of water, receding ponds, especially now along riverways and stuff as things dry up for shorebirds, green herons like this. It's um, it, it usually works well. But uh, kayaks, uh, we were talking about vehicles as a blind. I don't know what it is, um, but for whatever reason, when you're in a boat, you're in a kayak, um, kayak especially, I kayak a lot. 
these birds, for the most part, allow you to get right up to them. I, I don't know why. Uh, they can obviously see you, but uh, you're, you must be much more intimidating on land or even when you're near the shore laying down. I mean, I've been able to, you know, paddle right up to things. You know, you see these common organsers, the green heron. Um, and this is along the Susquehanna River, not far from uh, where I grew up, uh, another common merganser. Uh, well, this one minded my approach a little bit. So it's taken off. <laughs> but, but notice he's but he's taking off at you too, or you know what I mean. He's tilted. He's yeah. angled at yeah. the camera, not away, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but again, oh, uh, kingfisher, notoriously skittish bird. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, I mean I, that was you know, you know, very very close. So uh, when you're in a kayak, they're probably used to seeing kayaks. I don't know, but if you're in a boat, I would say you know. If you don't have a motor, I think that's a good thing. So if you're paddling, um, you're able to get close to some of these things. Here's a kingfisher uh, playing around uh, with a small fish, a small catch that it just got again along a riverway. So uh, being in one of these things, you know, exponentially increases your chances to get some of these animals. Scott, you've got a really good story. I know with loons a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, you were you're talking about, you know, you were in a specialized float and it was abnormal to the loons and you got a kayak, which they were used to seeing. And they didn't care. So, yeah, I, I uh, swear, uh, I, I, you know, I've had a couple bad moments in my photography life where I thought there's a small chance I'll die. You know, you go out to the Barnegat, <laughs> Barnegat jetty or any of these jetties in the middle of January and it's slippery and icy. And I've lost uh, a camera and a, a good camera and a good lens to the bottom of that jetty um, <laughs> that fell out. It just fell out of my backpack. That was sloppy. Um, yeah, I, I've, shared a story about getting stuck in the mud one time and you know there's that brief second of panic where you're like am I gonna you know sink out here by myself with nobody to find me uh, the closest I ever came to having a heart attack was in that situation we we were trudging around this lake and we in these little floating blinds and I we I'm, wetsuits flippers the whole nine yards and we are covering massive amounts and listen I'm not an out of shape guy but I am by no means an athlete so after about an hour in the water. I, I am literally thinking my heart is going to blow and I'm going to have a heart attack. And these loons, I mean, we're in camouflaged floating blinds and these loons, they know it. Like they're, they're not coming close. They're constantly turning away from us. They're constantly pushing away. And I was just so frustrated and I'm sitting there about to die in the middle of this lake. And all of a sudden this kayaker comes through and these loons, I kid you not, were five feet away from the kayak. They literally swam up to the here we are dying in this lake chasing these things around in these special concealed floating blinds with camouflage and you know we're gonna be smarter than the loons and all we they 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 weren't used to seeing that they were used to seeing kayaks on that lake all day long they could care less about the kayak the next day we ditched everything and we went out with kayaks and we got some really great shots so yeah it for sure it matters you know kind of what what that um what they're familiar with and it goes back to knowing the subjects, knowing the spots, knowing the locations. Um, sometimes on the sides of the, the lake, one thing I would advise is camouflage definitely helps. So I keep a very thin camouflage net. This next series of shots, all of these were shot from that situation where I just had camouflage over me. Anytime I go to photograph uh, waterfowl, if I'm, if I'm ready for it, I keep this it's a little bit, I'll, you know, I'll link it in the video. I'll just put a couple links, if anything, I can remember that we we mentioned here. It's maybe like 10, 15 bucks or something like that. It's just real cheap. It dries off pretty quick. Uh, some camouflage, you'll have to play around to find the netting that works for you. Some of it works really well, and some of it doesn't. But these this series of images all came from uh, using that, that camouflage along the shoreline. So, um, yeah, if you've got it, Throw it over the camera. Try to cover your head. Josh mentioned the eyes are a big deal. Throw that over yourself. There are um, blanket blinds, which Josh is going to show you in a minute. And then there's also just pieces of camo. I just use, I do have a blanket blind that I'll, I'll show you a setup that I use. But um, just a piece of camo netting that's real cheap and light. Just take it with you when you get down to the shoreline. Drape it over if you can. Put it over your head if you can and cover the camera a little bit. It, it definitely, definitely, definitely helps. It conceals some of the movement that might be there. And it breaks up your shape a little bit. Even if your legs are hanging out the back, if you can get that camo over the camera and your your head, I think it's uh, it'll help you a little bit. So. And, and when I'm floating in a kayak, too, I try not to bring a big lens. I'll normally have a zoom lens. Something, you know, versatile, like a 100 to 500 uh, I shoot right now. So I'll throw that in the kayak and, you know, 
it expands, contracts, put it you know right between your legs, boom, you're good. Yep. If you bring something larger than that and something bulky, it's 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 harder to maneuver, and especially if you're trying to lean over or get lower and you're in water line. So you want to think about what type of gear you want to bring. And I would say anything that's light and more flexible is probably a better solution when you're in the kayak. So yeah. Here's, I use this all the time when I'm in the field. This is a throw blind. Um, I think it's Lensco. There's probably other brands out there, but again, get down, throw that over you flat as a pancake and you melt right into the environment. I don't know if I'm melting in, in this picture, this pretty good yard, but, but I mean, <laughs> that said, uh, but it's you, very versatile too. Um, yep. you throw this in your backpack. If you're hiking, you're moving around, you can take it out. It weighs nothing drape it around you and you're ready to go. Um, so I, I typically use this, well, I use this most of the time actually. If I'm hiking, I'm traveling distances, um, and I've got one set up in particular, I'll use this. Uh, and it comes in very, very handy in those situations. And again, if you have a tool like this and it only takes a couple of seconds to throw over you, it, it, it cannot hurt. If you're concealing yourself and you're using these types of tools in the field, you're going to, you're going to increase your chances on getting closer to wildlife and having them interact, behave, or do whatever close to you and not flush or run or, or, or fly away from you. So this, um, it's essential. I use it all the time as much as I can, and it cannot hurt. Yeah. I would say if, if you are looking for a, a entry level basic blind. I use this. I have some images at the end. I have the exact same blind. I'll put it down in the description. If anybody just wants to click and find it, you can find it there. Um, I think they cost about a hundred bucks. I could be off on the price a little bit, but very versatile. The other thing it works really well on a, I, I, is this on a, you don't have a tripod under there. You're just hand holding in this. Hand picture. holding. But yeah. I, I do use it with a right. tripod. It, it drapes right around yep. the same thing. Same yep. concept. Yeah, I use it a lot. Instead of building a blind at my house, um, I think I would actually get thrown out for that um, by my better half. <laughs> so I take a uh, tripod, I set up a stool, and I have some shots on feeders. And this is what I use when I'm on feeders. I My feeder birds, I call them feeder birds. They're not typical feeder birds because I don't really keep feeders out. So the birds that come in are pretty skittish. They're still, they're coming into feed or they're coming into a little water feature, but they are generally not going to let me just stand there and take pictures of them. Some feeder birds will actually let you do that. Um, let me show a couple more um, before I get back to Josh. Josh is going to show his blind, his actual blind. Um, I'm going to show you a couple more images that I captured. Now, this one I'm actually in the water for, and I'll use a variety of different things. I think on this one I was in, I, I buried a tripod, not buried, I put a tripod in the water. I don't use that blanket blind that Josh showed. So I'm not using this because I, it gets wet. It's kind of a cotton material, but I am just draping over some nylon that dries very quick. So super, super lightweight and I'm under it as well. So I'm under it, he's under it and I'm in the water this time, either in waders or dry suit. In fact, Josh made me put this picture in. This is, <laughs> this is a... Uh, the so gloves are my favorite. That is just... I got such a hard time. So let me explain this picture just so for once and for all I could put, this is the stupidest looking picture of me I can find anywhere. Um, but it's fun to make fun of yourself sometimes. So here's the deal. <laughs> These waders, we were in Alaska with my friend Theo and the bugs are just, first of all, the bugs are horrendous. So I wish I would have, I would have put gloves on just to keep the mosquitoes off me. You could see the netting on my face. I've been in the water at about, for about an hour at this point. The reason I wear those, uh, we call these the cow enema gloves. They're not really for that. They're some kind of gardening glove, but you can see they come all the way up past your elbows. So let me, I'm going to go to a headshot real quick. Hang on. Let me just, okay. So when you're in the water with waders and you've got like a tripod and you put your elbows down, they, they end up in the water. And if it's cold, it's very uncomfortable. So that is what these gloves are for. They're actually to keep my elbows or if I dip my arm down from getting soaked in cold water. So there is a purpose for the cow enema gloves. Um, I don't know what the purpose of the red is on the end of the glove other than it's just funny, but um, that's my story. That, that's how this picture evolved. Um, and that's what it is. Oh, you man. mixed in well with like a Sandhill Crane cap. <laughs> the red, the funniest thing is there's all this camo and then there's these flaming red <laughs> gloves. It's just hysterical. All right. So uh, a couple more of that setup, though, uh, either in waders or a dry suit with a tripod or some kind of other device in the water. 
Uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of images, what you can get. And notice that all of these birds are very close. These are pretty skittish. Um, yeah, so, so not necessarily birds that I would get from the shoreline. But once you're in the water, it's incredible how much different it is and how approachable birds will be to you. Josh mentioned um, smaller bodies of water. I love coves. So even on a bigger body of water, I'll try to find that little inlet or that little cove that kind of funnels them in closer. And I'll set up in those areas. You can actually see the background here, some marshland. This is probably two, 300 feet across, but it's narrow enough that the birds eventually would kind of swim through the cove. And if they came in on one side, they would loop back around and then they'd come back right in front of me. And that's, you know, that's how I achieve these, these images here. I'll go back to Josh's real quick. And here. Yeah, now this is a blind uh, I use a lot. I actually love this blind. It's uh, it's blind by Tragapan is the name of the company. The name of the blind itself, I think, is called Hokey. It's H-O-K-K-I is the name. And it's a ground blind. And I just love it. Um, it's excellent. I've used this for grouse, actually, just this spring. Um, I've used this for shorebirds, uh, wading birds. And the reason why I like to use blinds in certain instances, and this is, I think, important, too, if I'm going to be in a situation where I'm going to be there for many hours, you know, uh, the grouse, for instance, this spring, I would set up, I would have this set up, I'd get in pre-dawn, and I would be in the blind for three, four hours at a time, sometimes even longer. And maybe I have different lenses with me. I might have a 600 or maybe I have an intermediate lens. I can store all of that gear inside the blind. If I had a throw blind, it would be much trickier. So if I'm set up in a, in a throw blind and I want to switch lenses or the bird is too close or I want a more scenic shot, you really can't do that. I mean, any movement inside the blind, I try to be as quiet as possible. You're, it'll be minimal disturbance versus if you had a throw blind. So this is something where I'm set up more permanent and when I want more flexibility and when I need more gear. Uh, but it's excellent. This is one of the first blinds I've seen on the market that you could set up at a ground level. Most of the tent blinds, they're a little higher up. Uh, obviously, and most of the blinds are made for hunting and so forth. But you can see I, I, I'm in the blind with my lens down low, and this is shooting right down, looking down. So again, it's it's got a low profile. It blends in fairly well in most environments, uh, and it's great. So something I highly recommend. And again, it goes into a nice little duffel like that. It's easy to carry and move around, but uh, it's something I, I use more often than not when I'm going to be in one place for an extended amount of time or when I have more than one lens or uh, additional gear. Yeah, and that little it, tent is nice because it does give you a little bit of freedom to move if you need to stretch your arm or you want to check Instagram or you want to like call yeah. your friend. Like You have some flexibility to move where a lot of times if you have a camo thing thrown on you and subjects are close, you feel like ah, I, I, I'm kind of locked into place. I can't really move. I can't do anything. So um, yeah. yeah, let me show yeah. let me show you my blind. So Josh and I shot together. Now, this is what Josh was using. Now, this is what Scott was using. This is the low budget blind. And I, I put this out there for a reason because it works. Um, I bring this to the water's edge sometimes if I know. So I can't do this if it's a quick setup. Um, I, I may not be able to get this up. It takes about 10 or 15 seconds to set up. It's really, really, really easy. It's just a couple garden stakes with some netting thrown over. Here's the deal. It breaks up my shape. And it's a permanent barrier so that if I'm moving a little bit, the camouflage isn't moving with me. It, I will tell you, I've used this about four or five times. It actually works pretty good. <laughs> so if you're looking for a bargain basement budget, this costs about 15 bucks probably to get the netting and the little hoops or the uh, tent stakes for gardening. You just you know buy some kind of stake and just strap it up. But it, it will help you. Um, I've seen people just take two stakes and stick them in the ground with camouflage in front. That will absolutely work. Cut a little slit down the middle, stick your lens through there, you're good to go. So I just wanted to put that out as another option. If you're on a budget and you need something, you could consider something like this as well. I forgot I had that picture up. So uh, I tried that, to pull it up real quick. That probably dries fairly quickly too, I'm thinking. Yeah, super, about, right? yeah, super fast. Wet, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's easy to set up. Like I said, I could set it up in 15 seconds. So it's just, it's something yeah. I keep in the car. If, I, if I'm in a situation, especially if I'm anticipating somebody coming around the corner, I can get down in front of them, set it up, kind of wait there. If they don't show up right away, no big deal. And it gives me a little, it's not as nice as this, obviously. I can't move around, but I can move around a little bit and I don't feel like I'm uh, I'm yeah. disrupting the birds. You know, that's an interesting point, Scott. So on this blind, it takes me about five minutes to set up the, the hokey blind. And that's another thing too. When do you arrive, right? So when I was shooting grouse, I would have this blind set up in the dark 
I would get there pre-dawn, I would have flashlights, everything would be set up. What you don't want to do is get there when the animal's there. Your subject's already there, it's, you know, it's doing its thing, it's behaving. You don't want to just walk up to it, flush it, set up the blind, and then you're ready maybe 10, 15 minutes later. And then of course you have to wait hours and hours and maybe it never comes back. So one of the most important things to it to consider is when do you set up and when do you situate yourself in the field? And to be fair to animals too, when do you remove yourself from that situation? You know, if you get the shot, you know, you're there, you're waiting a couple of hours, you get the shot, and let's just say all of these shorebirds are feeding in front of you and they're migrating through and they're, you know, gathering up precious energy to head to the Arctic. Do you just get up and flush them and just leave and walk to your car? Or maybe you wait for a more opportune time when the birds have moved on, you can slowly get out of that situation. So things to consider too, and these are all very, very important. And it adds to the success of whether you're going to get great shots or maybe you walk away with nothing. So something to think about. How often do you wear this? You know, I'll tell you what, I do wear it a lot, believe it or not. And this is a ghillie suit. Where the name comes from, I have no idea. I think these originally became a thing in like World War II. I think snipers, maybe the Brits. Yep. Um, I think Americans use these things too. But uh, it's called a ghillie suit. They're very cheap. I got it online and I have to say, I love them. Now I've made a lot of mistakes with this suit. Do not um, submerge yourself in the water. It takes forever to dry out. Uh, do not walk through creeks. Do not walk through um, certain areas of the forest where there's like, you know, uh, barbed wire, uh, thorny picker bushes and stuff. They will all just become <laughs> part of the suit. So you have to watch when you use it. But that being said, I love this when I'm under the canopy for songbirds. And I think it might be the next shot you'll see. So this is what it looks like, obviously, with the suit on. And if you go to the next shot, so I just went into you know, <laughs> a tree here in the backyard. Look at that. I mean, this is what I do in the field. I mean, you're almost you're practically invisible. Yeah. So, and, and you can adjust too. I mean, if you want to set up and you see something, you can kind of get right in. And, and frankly, you blend right in with the environment. So. And you don't have to do any setup. You don't have to drape blind over you. You don't have to set the blind up. And you can get a lot of great shots through that. So the only other thing I use that's not pictured here, so I basically use the ghillie suit. I have the, uh, the ground blind, and I have the throw blind. I also have a tent blind, too. I didn't have a picture of it, but I have a chair. I'll sit in that, and that's when I want to shoot at an elevated position. So if you know, I'm in the forest canopy or I'm somewhere where I don't want to shoot at the ground level, and I want to shoot at a more elevated position, I have the, uh, the, I call it the tent blind, but in any event. And, and again, most animals, if you're not shooting in public spaces or you're not shooting in areas where they've never seen a person before, they're curious about you, which is rare, you want to be concealed. Uh, these shots were all taken from some sort of concealment. Uh, that's a horn grebe displaying. There's an eared grebe. Again, concealed. I either had a ghillie suit on or I had a throw blind on for these shots. These are Western grebes displaying. Baird sparrow, fairly rare sparrow. This was in the grasslands of North Dakota. Um, took this from a blind out on the uh, out on the open prairie. And again, this is natural behavior. These birds are flying around, watching them. Avocets, very skittish shorebirds. These birds were actually on territory, set up in the uh, in the throw blind, laying down at the shoreline. Um, none of these shots would be possible if I if I didn't have a blind on because of these birds. American avocet. This was in North Dakota. That's a Wilson's fallow rope, actually. That's the very male. Nice. Fallow ropes are interesting because yes. it's actually the female that's more colorful um, and the, the, the more dominant of the sexes too, especially when it relates to certain things So when it comes to raising the young and the like. So it's really cool. So the males are actually drabber than the females are, so they're really cool birds. Uh, least sandpipers, uh, pectoral sandpipers. Shorebirds are really interesting. And one thing I see... Wait, wait where, did you, where did you shoot this? The same spot you actually met oh, with me. This was uh, along the Riverway. Yeah, this oh, was last year, uh, early last year. Yeah, they're just, oh. I, you know, and I, I've seen these birds in the Arctic too. And when you see them anywhere, just to think about their journey and where they're heading, you know, going down to South America, it's so amazing. But again, uh, you need to be concealed for a lot of these birds. Now, and the question is too, when you're approaching, so in some cases, what I'll do, I'll show up. This was actually an evening shoot. So you show up. And you'll see these birds and you want to approach nice and slow. What I try to do, especially when it comes to shorebirds, I'll walk very slow. I'll crawl if I can. 
Um, and then if they stop foraging and they look, or maybe one calls, of course you have your killed deer, your yellow lakes, they'll normally call first. You just stop, you stay still, don't do anything. Once they start foraging again, moving along, then I'll start moving slowly, slowly until I think I know where I'm gonna be. Put the throw blind on, relax, let the birds calm down, and then eventually you'll get what you want. Hopefully they'll come close to you, they'll forge right in front of you. Uh, if you're just laying there without a blind, probably not. Uh, they may stay close, but they're not going to come super close to you. Yeah. And again, it's all about natural behavior. This isn't something you can force. Like I, this is a dragonfly larva. You can't, you can't force that. This is something that just has has to happen. When you see birds eating and foraging, that's a solitary sandpiper. You can see it's it's this shot's kind of interesting. It's almost like the. Uh, the insects are flying right into its mouth. There's a whole line ready to go in this yep. solitary's mouth. <laughs> the landing again, pad. Natural, natural behavior. Here's um, a green heron again. A small, small pool foraging, actually dropping, dropping the fish. Rails. When it comes to getting close, I love rails, by the way. And when it comes to rails, like you said before, Scott, when you showed the clapper rail shot, they're super, super secretive. Um, I've studied this bird in particular, or its offspring, for the past three years. Um, I know its movements, I know the general area where it nests, what it does, and at high tide, there's a specific time of day, I've seen it, this bird will swim back and forth, and again, set up in a blind, be ready, know your subject. Actually, I took this this spring, this bird was swimming across, when high key, it was cloudy, and uh, it made for a nice shot, especially, you get the subtle redness in the eye. Let me, let me just cut you off for a second, Josh. Josh yeah. shoots, Josh has a couple, you know, couple good spots for migrating shorebirds, right? So uh, king rail, uh, pectoral sandpiper, all these amazing birds. He invites me up there. He he gives me one kill deer. <laughs> he, he gives me a kill. And I know he had it in a cage. And he was like, all right, scare all the birds off. And, and at the very end, just release the kill deer for keys just so we can taunt him with it. So he released the kill deer in front of me about uh, 10 minutes before we were ready to leave. But but to your point about I like those guys with ATVs. I gave him a $20 bill each yeah. to drive around. Yeah. But to your point like we to get those to get any shot listen you don't know what's going to show up in a, a at a puddle of water anything shows up. But we set up for an evening shot about 90 minutes before we anticipated really shooting like at least an hour. So we set up and said listen we're going to give ourselves a good hour to be here if something comes in great the light but we were there in you know pretty harsh light at the beginning then it started to soften up and get really really good and then it kind of dipped below and these killed deer came out we got a couple nice shots I, I think i edited one out of that 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 package but you know but that's kind of what you have to do sometimes you just have to sit there i don't know if we didn't have the camouflage or some concealment but we were with another person who i don't think was under camouflage but because he was there so long um, and, and dressed in camouflage and some concealment, but not under a blind, but because he was there so long. So I think the biggest part is get set up, be quiet, don't move and be patient. Like that's the biggest part. That's number one. Number two, some birds, you probably do need some concealment. Um, and it's certainly, certainly not ever going to hurt. And you will definitely get some shots because of that concealment that you would probably, that you would, ah, uh, this is now you're taunting me. God, the, uh, actually, the, the previous shot, the king rail, that's actually eating an oyster toadfish. It's this really weird-looking fish. But mm. anyhow, I try to photograph rails for the most part whenever you have high tide and flooding. Uh, the, there is, it was high tide. There was a lot of flooding. There was a steady rain the night before. And those are the times I'll try to go for these birds because they get pushed out to the edge of the marsh. And I knew this general area. I actually had that ghillie suit on, and I kind of backed up into the – and to the, I guess it was the, maybe the Phragmites or the bulrushes there blended in. And I was able to get this behavior again, natural behavior. The bird came out to forage, and I, this was I was so excited for this just to see a king rail, oh. to see it, uh, Virginia, Virginia rail, rail. Um, two competing uh, couples on either side of this one area, very active. I studied these birds probably for two weeks, and that led up to this shot. I was concealed. I had. Um, Actually, I had an off-camera flash. This was almost this was almost at night for the most part, and uh, I had it mounted on a tree, and it came down, and you could see again. It picked up this spider. I think it's I want to say maybe a wolf spider. I'm not sure what the species is, but again, it was um, it was just a really cool moment, and the direction of the flash created yep. that that shadow on the yep. on the Virginia rail. So yeah. I thought that was super cool.
And you don't Sora. see it, it, Are these Maryland birds or Pennsylvania birds? Uh, this is Pennsylvania. Yeah. So, uh, listen, Soar is not a common bird in Pennsylvania. I mean, there are some areas along the marshlands you can find them for sure, but they're pretty secretive. They don't come out, you know, all the time. Yeah, you're right. Um, their specific areas are very localized in terms of where they breed. Uh, I get them in Maryland on migration, especially in the fall. They come down in big numbers, but there's a small breeding population in certain wetlands in Pennsylvania. Um, and then if you go to certain states like North Dakota, they're just all over the place. Yeah. But uh, re again, a really cool bird. I just, I just love rails. This is an American bitter, another very shy bird. Very uh, I found this bird on territory, uh, shot this concealed uh, from some cattails and it was actually raining. I spent a couple hours just watching this bird and this bird sat there for the longest time. And, you know, the rain was just coming down. Actually, the, the one raindrop you can see there, it almost looks like a tear. Yep. It's it's coming down its face. Crazy. I thought that was really cool. Again, very, very secretive. Yeah, I would have it, never got these photos if I just walked in. Yep. I mean, it would be frankly impossible. Yeah, I, I, I will tell you, I, I mean, I look at 100,000 bird photographs a day. I very, very rarely see American bitterns photographed at all. And generally, mm -hmm. they are, I, I don't want to like say poor photography. I, they're just not good images in terms of art, you know, because there's very little separation or isolation. They tend to be just buried in the marsh and you can make good shots out of that. But um, normally, you know, kind of you, you'll see them sh like people standing up like on a boardwalky kind of thing and maybe they see one and they shoot down into it. But to get these kind of looks of American bitterness, I'm telling you, it's very, very, very rare, especially around here. We we don't get a ton of them and yeah. they're here, but they're just hard to find. Like they literally yeah. just sit there in the marshes and sometimes they'll just sit there for hours and they don't even move. They just completely frozen. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, this shot, I was actually, I had, I was almost chest deep in water. Um, I was at a very low angle and the bird here you'll see is calling actually the female is not that far away. This bird is fairly protective of the female and they were on nest, which is really cool. One thing I'll say about bitterns, it's much easier to find them uh, when they're breeding in summer months because all of the foliage is green you can see around them and they stick out a little more it's in the winter time when everything's dead yep. and everything's that tan color where yep. they're in cattails or very very difficult to spot and they're not they're not vocalizing either because they're not on the territory yep. so it's a lot harder to, to find them what a crazy and this was after isn't that yeah I, i've never seen this look before this was actually after a vocalization and the bittern tucked its head in um and again i was i, I was at lucky enough to be near a head-on angle there uh, and it was just a super cool shot. You know, it's, it's a pretty badass look. Um, black skimmers. A lot of folks will shoot black skimmers. They'll be able to walk right up to them, and you know, they're they're lined off in these these rookeries or these breeding colonies in certain spots on the East Coast. This shot was actually taken on a barrier island, so these birds were not used to people. You couldn't get up and position yourself, so got there early, had a throw blind on, and just waited. Again, natural behavior. You had the uh, this the, the bird on the left came in. It was actually given the bird. On, I, I think maybe I I can't really sex these birds, but in any event, there were a couple, and they were handing this fish. The, the one was handing the fish off to the other uh, uh, as part of either a courtship display or maybe feeding young. I don't know if they had young, but uh, just to see that fish in the middle was pretty cool. I took this shot up in Quebec. This is a northern gannet, and I took this from a blind. It was actually at a rookery, and they had blinds you were able to walk into. So sometimes you could utilize just what's on site, and you walked, you looked right out of the blind, and these birds were actually nested just below you. The fly was a nice added touch, and that yeah. was <laughs> in situation that wasn't added in there. Oh my uh, gosh, You're killing me, man! You're it, killing it, me. So these, yeah, yeah. so this series, you're you're typically in camo for most of these, like these songbirds. I'm, I'm concealed for all of these, yeah. yeah. And again, you'll see, um, th this is all natural behavior. A lot of folks will say to me, you know, even somebody said to me, I think might have been for the king rail shot. You know, what did you do to bring that bird out? You know, where'd you have the speaker? I'm like, I there's no, you can't call the oyster toadfish to jump and yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. It's a right. matter of being right. there and being patient and studying and just spending a lot of time in the field. Uh, this is um, elderberry. I know it's elderberry. Yeah, I can <laughs> say you got this in your backyard. That's why I kept it up here. <laughs> yeah, late summer, it's great for fall migrants. They love yeah. these berries. Uh, black billed cuckoo, super super skittish and I was set up in a tent blind. Um, this was a, a field not far uh, from where I grew up in Pennsylvania. This patch of elderberry is money. 
when it comes to times and just wait. And, you know, it, it's very rare to get close to black belt cuckoo. They're super skittish. Yeah. Let me jump over. I've got one more series. I'm going to, um, yeah, where are we? Okay. I got one more series I want to show because I do get questions about, um, some of these birds. I, I wanted to show a series that I took from using a, a floating blind. So a, a very effective way to shoot. I told you the story about the loon and how it was not very effective, but, um, you know, a couple mornings out in the marsh and you get some nice silhouettes. Look at this. No idea. Like no idea. I, this is eight feet away from a, a night heron. And, um, we talk about the depth, depth of field. In this case, the, it's the bill that is completely out of focus. I like this look. I know a lot of people don't like it, but uh, eyes in focus and that bill out of focus. So, um, And then real quick, I'll run through a, a set of images. I, I told you I, I have some backyard stuff that I like to photograph once in a while. I set up this little, I have a video on YouTube about this backyard setup, by the way. Um, it worked It worked well for me last year. I was playing around with these, these kind of concept of like budget backyard features, how to create a drip on a budget and I, I posted this video um, and I was able to get some really neat images. All of these were, I told you, these aren't birds that are acclimated to feeders. They were just coming in for the water. So I needed a blind. I used that that same lens coat blind under a tripod. Um, even these blue jays, I'm telling you, I have blue jays all over my yard. They never let me photograph them, ever. So they are super, super, super skittish, um, at least the one, the population I have. Now you can habituate these birds at feeders and peanuts and all that, and you'll see these like people you probably train them to eat out of your hand if you wanted to, but these birds never once in, I've lived here for six years, have I photographed a blue jay in my yard until I was under the blind at this little water feature. Uh, morning dubs. Cor corvids and blackbirds in general are just very smart to humans. It's yes. so skittish. You, know? yes. you make a good point. You don't see a lot of great shots of blue jays outside of feeders because they're just skittish birds. Crows too, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact. Very rare do you see great shots of American crow, fish crow, raven even for that, if it's not by a dumpster. It's, it's hard yeah. to... It's hard to get those shots. Yep. And then, the, the, you know, this wood thrush was actually in, in the woods behind my house. And I, I hear him every night in the summer. Never photographed him. I very rarely saw him. But again, I'm in the blind now, waiting on the water. And, and I noticed this pattern. Josh said study behavior. Around the same time every night, they would come into the bath. And so I just figured, okay, I, you know, if I wait out there long enough, I'll get them. And uh, eventually, I got some nice shots. I don't love this because it's a, um, you can obviously tell it's a man-made feeder. But I set these rocks up in the hopes that they would land up on top of the rocks and it would look a little bit more natural. Um, and then just a bunch of other, I shared these, oh, excuse me, I shared these uh, other images in one of the other videos that I did about my backyard setup. But again, under the blind, a yellow rumped warbler in my backyard, very tough to photograph. And then a, a, this fox is never going to walk up or, or just sit there. He sat there for a minute in front of me. Again, chain link fence, not something I'm going to print and put on the wall, but for me, the moment was better than the photograph. Seeing this little fox pop its head through the fence in my backyard. Um, Mama Fox had just run through and I missed her. And I was kind of upset that I missed the fox at close range, uh, but I got a way better shot or a way better experience, I should say. Not a great photograph, but a way better experience as this little fox just peeked its head through the fence. Sat there for about a minute and then it just slowly crawled back under the fence to the den. Uh, by the way, I, they, these fox live near my house. I've never tried to find them. You know, interestingly enough, sometimes when they're when they're near you, you just, for me personally, I just, I just want to let them be. So I never looked for their den. They're, they're back there somewhere behind that chain link fence. But um, I don't, Such I, beautiful animals. Yeah, I, look at those eyes. And so, resilient, and so resilient, too. You know, I was a gnome in Alaska, which not far from the Arctic Circle. Red fox all over up there. You know, you would think in certain cases, you know, you'd see Arctic fox. But these birds are going further and further north, and they're just so resilient. Uh, and they're striking animals. I, I love them. Speak, way, speaking that, of speaking of the tundra, mustard? was that garlic mustard? Uh, let me go back. Uh, what time of year? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, that's uh -oh. garlic mustard. Yeah, uh -oh. oh, but yeah. I think that's an invasive one. Uh, it's not there anymore. I can promise you that. <laughs> <laughs> I, for those that don't know, I do a lot of native plant stories on Instagram. I spend hours. I spent about two hours this morning uh, gardening. Um, I, I garden almost every day. I, most when I say garden, I mean pull weeds almost every day. But it is working. I'm three years into this project. I made it a five-year project. I have two more years left, and I think I'm going to be in pretty good shape. So, And I just added a new water feature for next spring. So uh, I'm kind of excited about that. All right. So we've got uh, – we'll wrap up here. We've got some some loons. Yeah, these are, uh, this was a gnome, actually, in Alaska. Red-throated loons and set up uh, throw blind near the edge of the marsh. And we're able to get all kind of behaviors. We actually had them with young coming in and out of the pond. This is actually the same – I think it's the same pond, just a different direction. That's a uh, redneck phallop. 
Yeah. You can see it forage and they just, uh, it's the insects galore up there. When you're out on the tundra, um, I got one right in front of me. When you're out on the tundra, uh, when it gets, you know, mid June and past June, it's just, it's crazy netting everywhere and let, or, you know, thoughts and prayers are going to get chewed up. It That's is bad up there, man. It is, oh, it is so real. Bad. I've also heard so, Maine. I've never been up to Maine in summer, uh, or yeah. or well, you you live near uh, the eastern shore. I've, I've heard those areas That's could get bad. absolutely brutal. Yeah, uh, I think the worst place for bugs ever might be South Jersey in the Delaware Bay, like Bombay Hook, and then on the other side, uh, the you green head flies and oh. it's so bad. Yeah, if you guys have never experienced, I know that we're out. You know, some people locally will will be. Are, if you're if you ever been bitten by these green head flies they're absolutely brutal it is painful to get bitten by them it's not like a mosquito where you get bitten you don't know it till the next day i mean these yeah. things are just and and they pummel you i mean they just constantly are just hammering you uh i was stuck in a in a marsh one time and i actually was trying to get my my body under the water so that they just would would lay off me any area of exposed skin they were biting me through my shirt I mean, I wear long sleeves out there in the marsh because I don't want to get bit, and they're they're biting me through my shirt. They're hitting the like the little area on the back of my neck. Yeah, absolutely brutal. Show me, yeah. show me this. I was kind of curious. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that critter. We it's we're scary. not. But, we're going to do a show, and I'm not a hundred percent sure. I have a couple guests for this one, Josh. I may get you back for camera traps because I know you you're doing a little bit more and you're playing around. Um, explain. We're not going to do camera traps on this show, but Josh ha was was kind enough to send a few. Um, including this this really special shot. Um, you have to test your exposure, I guess. Yeah. That's the, the so, best way to do it. So what are we looking at here? So a whole lot of stuff. And you can get really overboard when it comes to camera trapping, or you could be very simple with it. Um, you could have a trail cam just to see what's going on, or you could kind of do some of this craziness that I'm doing. I kind of just got into this over the past couple of years. And the reason why I like it is, and again, this is the ultimate concealment it's it's you're concealed so well you're not even there you're just right. not in the situation so the biggest challenge is how do you conceal your gear and, and so right. forth but this is great because if you're in the northeast u.s or you're not in yellowstone or jackson hole and you want to photograph mammals and different animals that are really shy that you can't just get in the field or they're only active in the dark uh or they're nocturnal crepuscular or whatever um camera trapping is like a really cool thing and you can be in two places at once you can have this all set up and you could be out shooting somewhere else so it's really cool. But again, you need to know where the animal's movements are, where they're coming through. You know, you can't just set up and say, OK, this is pretty. I'm going to set up here and I'm going to get a shot. Yeah, um, there's a, that log you see me on. It was uh, on a family member uh, It was on his property. He knew the property well. He knew where all the animals were going through it was at the bottom of a ridge. It was a boggy area. So all the animals walked over this log. So I had a lot of good intel. That's why I set up there. So you have to be smart about where you set up. Yeah. In, it, pri it's, in private it's property. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't want to leave that in the middle of one of these state game lands. <laughs> no, probably not. No, probably, you know, if you see a turkey hunter going home with it, yeah. Right. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, so you have to be smart about where you set it up. But, you know, it, it's it's 99% miss. It's butt shots. It's, you know, misfires. But every now, and, every now and then you'll get some really cool stuff. Yeah. Let me just scroll through. These are some of your <laughs> images. <laughs> yeah. So you can see things will come very close. That's so back. funny. So that's um, Obviously, that's a black bear. Uh, coming right in to give the uh, camera sniff, and that's, that's that same log I was at again. This is, uh, oh. but that was up in the spring. Did you share you this just, one? Just, Did I miss this? And all kinds of good stuff. Yeah. This one. Yeah, I don't remember seeing this one. Did you share that's this one? A, uh, I might have. That was yeah. uh, a year ago. I took that. Okay. I think that was all right. Yeah. All right. Maybe I saw that one. Yeah. Oh that man. Remind you... uh, raccoon. Um, and I do this with songbirds, too. I have remote trap setups with songbirds. This is a Louisiana water thrush. There's a water thrush family I've been watching and studying for four years now. Uh, they're usually very successful. It's, it's a very, very interesting grouping. But in any event, I know the movements and where these birds go. And I've been I watched them watching. This shot was years in the making, actually, to finally get this set up. So very, um, very just so people understand how difficult this shot is I, I have tried some remote triggers i normally don't set up the traps but i will remote trigger meaning i'll set up a wide angle lens and i'll manually trigger it from a distance while i'm shooting you know so i may be over here shooting and if something walks in front of that i'll try to trigger it and i've set up on perches that i thought would work it is so frustrating um because they just they it has to be perfect how far away from the lens just so people get a context, because this looks like you're 10 feet away. How far away is that lens from that bird? 
uh, I don't know, maybe foot and a half, two yeah. feet. I yeah, say, maybe something like that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, and that's what you have to do. You have to hope that that bird comes within a foot or two of your lens and lands in the spot. So it, it is, it is very, very tough. So this was a trap though. This was, so this was triggered by motion yeah. or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This was a trap. Now, the thing is too, you have to be smart with your, your setup because you're trying to set up your exposure when you set it all up, right? You really can't, you can't modify it on the fly, obviously, but I'll try to stop down as much as I stop down to make sure you know I can get what I can and focus. It increases my chances of getting mm -hmm. a sharp bird or a sharp animal. But you don't want to stop down too much. You can see like the trees in the background; they're out of focus. You can see what they are, but they're not super in focus, and it's not distracting from the subject. So you have to play around with it. A lot of it's just all. Actually, this was something I set up actually on the Mar. We we're able to get out, and I I had to set up there. These are um, uh, hornbills. Um, the name, I know the name, I don't know why it's <laughs> slipping my mind right now. Giant hornbill, a ground hornbill, ground hornbill, I think it is. But uh, they walked right by, it was pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's it. Let me let me run back. I think I got through everything in both of our, yeah, I got through everything in both of our albums. Uh, let me run back up here. I'll bring you up, make you a little bigger now that we looked at your pretty picture. So uh, before we log off, anything you, you're still involved with some photo contests, right? Let's plug that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wild Art Photographer of the Year. Uh, this is the first year of the contest. Rob Reed, who is one of the founders of Bird Photographer of the Year, he started it this year. And it's incredible. Um, the submissions that we've been getting, it's actually 10 categories, and they run over 10 months. I judge the ice category, which is back in March, and I help judge the light category for Georgina Stadler, who's been on the show a couple times, yeah. obviously, you know, Georgina well uh, back in May. But the standard of photography is incredible. And for the folks watching, uh, backyards, the backyard uh, competition closes the 31st, so it closes on Tuesday. So if anybody's watching, they want it. There's only a few days to go in for that, and then next month is motion, uh, and that'll be a good category as well. So, end of these 10 categories, all the judges are going to come together, and we're going to pick the wild art photographer of the year. Basically, one of the gold winners of the 10. There's a gold winner each in each of the categories. So we have 10 gold winners, and we'll pick the wild art photographer of the year from there. But it's, yeah. it's really exciting stuff. And, uh, you know, it's uh, when you look at the participation and the amount of entries that have come in, um, it, it's exceptional for its first year. And I think it's going to continue to grow. I'm sure it is. Yeah, it's I, I will tell you, I, I watch because I see it, um, you know, you and sometimes Regina will, will post and share some of the images. And uh, it is it is some good stuff. Like, I, yeah. I'm not going to yeah. lie. And uh, it's I think inspiring. It, help, it, yeah. help, it inspires us too. Yep. I see some of the shots. I'm like, oh my god. You know, yeah, it's, and it's I think great. it's you know I look up to both of you two, and to know that you two are judges in the contest, it, it it's a reflection on the caliber of the images that are in the contest, and to me it validates it. It, it says, okay, this is. I hate to use the word like real real photo contest. Some of those photo contests out there, I just you know you're like you scratch your head. You're like, what? Well, I don't I don't get it. I don't get it. But yeah. every image that that I've seen, every one of these monthly submissions, I've I've been like, yeah. Hard, hard to argue that. So uh, very well yeah. done. Very good contest. And uh, I think the standard is very, very high for that. But yeah, certainly if you're interested, Backyard Birds is a good one. Anybody can enter that one. So yeah, if mm -hmm. you've got Especially some... Especially in COVID, everybody's yeah. been shooting in their backyard and, you know, camera trapping. Actually, what I was just talking about, folks do that all the time, it's just in their backyard. It's a great tool to see, you know, what's digging up your, your garden or what, what red fox is yeah. hanging on your deck. So... And is it is is it a bird is it is it a bird photography contest or a wildlife photography contest? It's it's wildlife, which okay. is great too because yeah. it's, it's versatile in the sense that anything comes in. We got macro insects all the way up to the megafauna, you know, the big five. And, yeah. Uh, but it's really cool, and you know, Rob when he put it together was really intentional on getting photographers there just to you know because that helps when you have photographers judging the contest. Yeah. I think that that you know I think that gives it a bit of. Uh, added not only credibility, but in terms of the output too, because it's yes. judged by photographers, which is helpful. Yep. Yep. Excellent. All right. Well, listen, my friend, it was, it was a great show. We went a little long today, but I told you, I used to, I, I'm not, I'm no longer sticking to the one hour format. I am sticking to the format that works. Um, loved your images. I, I said it in the beginning, I'll say it again. It's pretty intimidating to share, to share images against the guy that you think is probably one of the best wildlife <laughs> photographers in the country. However, yeah. I don't I, know, but I doubt that. <laughs> however, um, it's it's always a pleasure to have you. You will definitely be on again. I know I know we're going to do more shows together. It was our plan to kind of do at least two shows a year together. So, uh, and I think we do a happy hour show, kind of just where we drink and answer questions. So hopefully, oh, we can we can 
Yeah, we do that. <laughs> we'll do that maybe around the holidays i think we did it last year around christmas so maybe around christmas we'll do another uh another just call in we'll drink you ask us questions show so anyway thank that you sounds uh, good to me yeah hey listen drinking and talking about birds is always good for me <laughs> yeah me too and thanks again for having me scott i really appreciate it it was a great conversation one last thing actually i forgot to mention um silent shutters uh, i've been converting oh, from yes, yes, dslr yes. to mirrorless something to consider too yep. when you're concealed if the mirror slap depending upon the camera can start a wildlife if you have a silent shutter use it it's gonna help yep uh, i have switched 100 percent of my waterfowl photography to mirrorless for that reason uh waterfowl are typically so skittish and so alert that even a sound sometimes and again it's not going to flush them off the lake but they'll just turn their back and they'll they'll kind of carry along uh, for my fall migration warblers, I showed you a bunch of those in that depth of field kind of thing. Um, I get very, very close looks, and very often they land in front of me. I hit the shutter, and they're gone. I will probably go to a mirrorless setup this year for that reason. Even though I don't like mirrorless, I did a video on this about why I'm a, Ni I'm a Nikon shooter. Uh, I don't want to hear about your R5s and your Sonys. I don't want to hear about that. I'm telling you this. If you're shooting Nikons for songbirds and you're on their mirrorless systems, it is it is tough. So uh, I'm saving up some money. Hopefully they can get their act together and I'll buy their flagship maybe. But uh, man, it's tough. But I am going to commit to doing um, probably a, a electronic shutter for these these migrating songbirds because I get these really close looks and, they, and often they just get scared off. So anyway. All right. I will, I will uh, say goodnight to you. I'm going to flip over. Uh, you have a great evening. I'm going to say goodbye to the rest of these guys. And thank you for tuning in tonight. What a wonderful episode. And, you know, I, I say this to Josh because he is just a terrific photographer. Um, I really, really admire his work. I do think I've got a video coming up about five must-follow Instagram accounts for bird photographers, and they're, it's focused around American or U.S. Uh, photographers. I will give you the spoiler alert. He's on the list. So uh, I think he is a tremendous photographer. Uh, one of the things I hope you took away from this is, listen, it, bird photography can be different things to different people some people want to just document what they see and share the joy that they have in that and i hope it at no point do does josh or myself come across as elitist in the sense that hey you have to do this to produce something that that's okay it's something that that i take very seriously and josh takes very seriously and you see the quality of the work that's there uh, especially from josh it's not it's not by accident um it's not luck it is a lot of work. And I talked to Josh over the summer and he was telling me about these, these traps that he was setting up and you know, getting up at two, three in the morning to beat the light in certain areas and studying the behavior, not just for, for a day or two, but for a week or a month or a year or multiple years to get these shots. So it is a lot of work. And I, I don't say that because I, I don't think everybody has to do that. There's no, um, there's no qualifier on being a great bird photographer, but it is a lot of work to produce the types of images that Josh produces. And I wanna really highlight the work that goes into that. One of the reasons I respect Josh so much is not just because of the quality of the images that he produces, it's the amount of time and the work and the energy that he puts into it. And in an attempt to do it the right way with minimizing disturbance and creating these really natural shots. And, you know, he highlighted that rail shot with the I don't know, frog fish or whatever it was, but you know, what a great, example of studying behavior, being patient, uh, not being disruptive, and then getting an incredible image out of it. So anyway, I wanted to uh, thank Josh again for being on the show. I wanted to thank you guys for listening in for all your continued support. I really, really do appreciate it. Check out the, uh, if you're not subscribed to the channel, absolutely make sure you subscribe. I got a lot of videos coming out in September, all themed around social media, particularly around Instagram. I think you guys will find it interesting. So thanks for tuning in, and hopefully we can continue to find inspiration in wildlife together. Thanks for tuning in to another live episode of Wildlife Inspired. If you're not a subscriber, you're going to want to make sure you hit the subscribe button now. And if you like the video, give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. I love to hear it. Now you can find me on my social media contacts down here at SP's Images and on my website, skeesimages.com. If you enjoy the content, you're also going to want to check out patreon.com backslash wildlife inspired, my subscription site where I take you in the field and behind the scenes, and I offer lots of editing advice in both Lightroom and Photoshop. I also have videos there that are archived only for Patreon subscribers. I do want to thank you for your ongoing support. 
and I hope we can continue to find inspiration in wildlife together.